Well, it's exciting times. Look at what's happened between last week and this week. A little more on that in a moment. But we live, don't we, in a dramatic time. Here we usher in a year, brethren and sisters, which is probably one generation from indeed the state when the nation of Israel stood up, the fig tree came into existence. So here we are, 70 years from that time. So maybe we're at a very critical time, brethren and sisters, a very exciting time. But now look at what Jesus said. What did Jesus call on us to do? What he called on us, and let's direct our attention particularly at the key points. He told us, called on us to take heed, to watch and pray. For you know not when the time is. Is it going to be this year? We don't know, but it looks very exciting. But however, let us watch, or as the word means, be vigilant, therefore. Lest coming suddenly, we're asleep. Now the aim of our nights tonight and last time is that we might be well and truly awake, well and truly alert and attentive to God's words and indeed watching and vigilant about our own behaviour so that we might be walking in God's way when Christ returns. Well, let's briefly go back over one or two things we looked at last time. Remember, here probably one of the most important papers in the world, news magazines, The Economist. Look at the date, only a week or so ago. Here's the front cover of that book. And what's it saying? The great threat of a great power conflict, World War III. There's where they're talking about. And they pointed out last week the Pentagon put China and Russia above jihadism as the main threat to America. But this week... The Chief Britain's general staff warned of a Russian attack. Now that's what we're expecting, isn't it? We know that from the Bible. And so here's that article. Speaking of the fact that the world is not prepared for the conflict that is about to come. The dominance America is gone. It's no longer that situation. And a conflict on the scale of intensity not seen from the Second World War is plausible. The world is not prepared. A key paper. Here's the next key one, the Newsweek. There it is, the date, back a month ago, a little over a month ago. And what's it all talking about? Preparing for World War III. There's what they're wanting to talk about. And here's the key article. Russia, surrounded by enemies, is ready for a fight and on epic proportions, an epic war for survival. At least that's what Vladimir Putin wants his countrymen to think. So he's put his country on full alert, war alert. He's preparing for World War III. And we saw that the scientists, there we are last year at this time, look where it was, almost the closest spot to World War III ever seen. And then only a week ago, brought it onto this position. The most dangerous scene ever. That's what they're saying. And look, we left last week and now this week. Dow's biggest fall ever. That's what they said. Of course, it bounced back up. But there's the headlines of the paper. A 1,500 point plunge. Apparently America lost in trading in that day over a trillion dollars. 600 million in our billion in our market. Staggering changes, instability on all sides. Now, the scripture tells us this. We could turn it up, but let's not. It's here. Behold, Yahweh maketh the earth empty and maketh it waste. As with the servants, so will the master. That's going to be the scene. The master, the servant, equal. As with the buyer and the seller, equal. As with the lender, as with the borrower, equal. As with the taker of usury, so the giving of usury. The land shall be utterly empty. Yahweh has spoken his word. There's a chapter that Brother Carter says has a greater fulfilment in the future than in the past. Now, Isla Collier 
Sorry, Brother Sully said this in reference to that chapter. Picture for yourself, reader, that's us. The state of things when these prophecies come to pass. All confidence in the money market gone. For there is neither buyer nor seller. All stocks and shares worthless. No banks. Scarcely any money. Little or no bread. There it is, brethren and sisters. There's the scene going to come. But Brother Sally's comment was, we won't see it until we go forth with the Lord Jesus Christ from Sinai. In other words, immediately after we're gone, he believes the collapse will come. Now think of that. Look at what we saw this week. Oh yes, it was a bounce. It's coming back, the share markets around the world. But it's looking grim. And any moment, it could go. We know that. The scene the world is in is chaotic. So time is short. Well, let's now come across particularly to Europe. Well, the time seems to be very short. We said this before. Every sign of Christ's imminent return seems to have moved ahead in the last few weeks indeed. Look at what we saw last time. We looked at Russia on the very borders of Israel. Now we're looking at Europe particularly. And first of all, Britain backs out of the EU. We expected that. That's nothing new to us. Goodness me, we've known that for long ago. Look what the scripture says. Ezekiel 38. Sheba and Dedan. So that's the Saudi Peninsula. And the merchants of Tarshish, Britain, and the young lions, the commonwealth thereof, shall say unto Russia, Gog, Art thou come to take a spoil? Hast thou assembled thy company to take away prey, to carry away silver and gold, to take away cattle and goods, to take a great spoil? So Russia comes into the Middle East and is opposed by the Tarshan powers and the Saudi powers, the the Sunni Arabs as we know. And we talked about last time. And Brother Thomas reading those things years and years ago said this, writing in Elpis Israel. Here we see it. The reader will see why Britain is not included in the Ten Toes. Well, there we are. We read of it. It opposes Russia and the Ten Toed Kingdom. She is reserved of God to antagonise Gog, and here writing in the past, as France did at the feet of Napoleon the the Grand. And then he goes on to say, Russia will rule the land. But Britain will rule the sea, and we'll see a little of that tonight. So let's have a look at where Britain is moving. We know it voted to leave, didn't we? But look at this. Brexit offensive. Britain is now changing its policies. It's not now looking to trading to Europe that much. It's now thinking it's got to go elsewhere. And so here's Theresa May, just only a week or so ago. Look at the date. Headed over towards China with dozens of other companies to set up a new trading relationship with there. And it looks like it's going to succeed in the short future. I don't think there's going to be a lot of time for it. So that's the first move. Next one, back in India. Wouldn't, that's no surprise to us, is it? We'd know that. There's Western Tarshish, Britain as it normally is, allying itself with Eastern Tarshish. And there we can see that situation. There's the Indian flag joined with the British flag. India is the seventh largest economy and the fourth largest investor in UK. While UK invests in India, it grew by 8.8% in the year 2016, expanding their trade and it's growing and growing. And Britain is also growing in another area. It's trading, there's Haifa. There's the British ships coming in with Israel. And that's, of course, going to be good for her because Israel is fantastic on business growth, finance, of course. Think of the Rothschild name, scientific strengths. Think of the new cars that are going to fill the earth if time were to permit. Driverless cars. Where was that initially designed? Israel. Okay, there. Well, Jewish design, I might say. But there we can see the scene. Britain is rejigging 
It's relationship in trade. But as well as that, it's being forced to rejig in its military defences. Russia could attack underwater internet cable, says the British military chief. Only about two months ago, Theresa May came on television and was one of the most vociferous discussions or comments made or speeches made. She was furious at Russia. And it didn't say clearly why, but when the papers came out, it was clear. Into her waters came Russian ships. Along with those Russian ships, they believed they were putting down under the sea drones in the form of submarines, remote submarines. And the ships were following along the cyber cables, the underwater communication cables, going into Britain, the internet cables, allowing her to link with Europe and the United States and putting something down along those cables. She was absolutely furious. And so as she saw the, the link with Europe and USA being possibly broken, she sent out aircraft to find all the Russian ships and then immediately, this is a month ago, a little over a month ago, sent out the naval vessels and drove the Russian ships out of her waters. So you see the scene is looking very tricky. Not only are they no longer trading to the same degree with Europe, or well, that's the prospect, but also the links with Europe in a moment could be broken. So if they send their soldiers over, what's going to happen? Well, here's the situation. There's some of the cables that are going around the world. And Russia has already sent cables down along this lot and this lot two years ago putting something on those cables. Massive increase of Russian submarine activities around the coasts of America over two years, and now Britain. And so the British Armed Force Chief says we've got to prepare for war. Look at the date. The Chief of Staff of the British Armed Forces has declared Britain must actively prepare for war with Brit Russia and other geopolitical rivals. Things are looking very, very tricky. And so Britain is acting. UK builds radar systems to protect the skies. What from? Russian aggression. Russian military activity in their waters and in the aircraft above. And so they're particularly concerned about what's going on. So Britain is financially backing out of Europe. And it is politically seeing it's going to be ostracised possibly in the near future and preparing to defend herself. Incredible scene. But now, Russia rallies her armies. What do we expect? We know Ezekiel 38, off by heart almost. Son of man, set thy face against the land of Magog, central Europe, and the prince of Rosh, Meshach and Tubal, and prophesy against him. And later on it talks of Goma, allied to the power of Rosh, Meshach and Tubal and Magog. So put that on a map. What do we see? Here it is. Taking that verse that we looked at a few moments ago, Rosh, Meshach and Tubal. There's the Russian territory. Later on in the same chapter it speaks of this power being toward the very north, just south of the North Pole. And of course it is. And here is the rest of Europe. So, almost all of Europe will be allied to Russia. That's what we're told. Not Britain, obviously. We know that from what we've already seen. So the situation's going to develop in the Russian area. Here's what Brother Thomas said in Exposition of Daniel. Listen to these words. There never has been such an age of conquest as that which will soon open upon the world. And as to the establishment of European freedom and independence, the war to be initiated is the setting in of an overwhelming inundation that will submerge them under one of the most terrible and scorching despotism that have ever wrung the heart of nations. Russia will move in and take control of Europe. There's the scene that he anticipated then. But now, brethren and sisters, 
look briefly over this year. Here's a few of the things that have gone through. Now, I'm going to go back over this year later on in a little bit more detail, but here's a few key points. Russian military, over a million. Another 2.4 million can be called up. Brings potentially about 3.5 million soldiers. Russia's biggest war games was last year. Right on the borders of Europe, we'll look at this in a minute again, 100,000 troops placed... Look at the date, actually September the 10th to the 22nd. And there's the economists again speaking about that. They said, it's a World War III threat. Russia troops won't leave after the war games. Oh, Russia said it would. They pulled them out. And as they pulled the soldiers out, when they went back, the trains went back to get more, there was more soldiers on board. They pulled out the active soldiers and it appears that they put in reservists. So the 100,000 are still there. More on that in a minute. Oh, sorry. So Putin unleashes a massive fleet into the Baltic Oceans and Russia prepares to attack America over the North Pole in that direction. More on that in a minute. So Russia could cut off the internet to the North Atlantic Treaty Organisation countries in Europe. That's what they're worried about. Cutting the undersea cables, here's the ships, off Britain. And so Europe could be cut off from its help from North Atlantic Group, from America, from Britain. Will they send their soldiers into Europe where they could be attacked? And where they've got no links back to home and command back in Britain and America? There's the fear that they have. So now... NATO begins to break up, the first part of it. North Atlantic breaking away from the rest of Europe. So Europe rewrites, oh yes, in fear. In fear for the moment. And so coming back to those quotes we looked at before. There we are, we expect, don't we, these countries to be allied together, to be united together. And Putin now builds up in the areas off Estonia, Latvia, Lithuania, the Baltic states, Poland here, huge numbers which were further increased this year. Further increased this year. Now, look at this little country here for a minute, Kaliningrad. Centre your attention on there. Let's have a look at it. There's Germany. There's the Baltic Sea. There's Sweden. There's Poland. Okay, now into that area, look at the date. Only a day or two ago, Russia has deployed nuclear-capable Iskander missiles, more than she had before, and are going in permanently in its enclave in Kaliningrad. Now, Kaliningrad was a little territory that when Russia retreated out of Europe, Russia never left. All of Europe, there it is, became independent, didn't it? The Iron Curtain came down. But not this little tiny territory there in that blue ring. Not much bigger than Tasmania. But now, Russia has continued to retain its control on that. And now they're pumping into this huge amounts of equipment. They're putting into their missiles. And we'll have a look at some of the others in a minute. Permanently placing them. And they're now 400 kilometres away these missiles can travel 400 kilometres and can hit almost all of Europe with nuclear weapons. And there's the fear. But at the same time, what about, Amer what about America? Going back a little now. But Trump says NATO is obsolete. What's he getting at? He said, listen, we'll help NATO... But they've got to pay for their part too. He went over and said, we spend 7%. All of you countries have got to at least spend 2%. And they said, no way. No way. And so he said, well, we're not going to help you. Unless you pay up, we get out. And there was a scene then. And that has increased in the American movement. More on it as time goes by. This then has come into the hearts and minds of everybody in that NATO group. 
And so countries are terrified. Oh, Czechoslovakia, Russia-friendly president wins the re-election. Re People are beginning to turn the other way in their fear. Remember, Czechoslovakia is almost on the borders of Russia. So they're afraid. And so they elected a Russian-friendly president into power. Look at the date. Happening so quickly. And again, again, look at the date. Western intelligence services fear Vienna's in Putin's pocket. A pro-Russian party now runs the police, the diplomacy and the army of Austria. Staggering changes. What about the other countries? Oh, well, they're getting frightened. They haven't gone a line toward Russia, but others, Sweden, is instructing its people what to do if Russia takes over. Now, concern, anxiety over Russian aggression, steps to prepare to war with Russia. There we are. And here's the earlier one. A similar situation. Lithuania published a manual sent out to 3 million citizens what to do when Russia takes over. They've started conscripting their people, but they're telling them how to prepare to survive. 75-page book for everybody, what to do when Russia takes over. Imagine if we got it. Everybody in their letterbox. How would you feel? And on the other side, Magog, Germany, quietly working to unite a European militaries. Apparently she's got hold of about 27 crack soldiers, commanders, and sending them to all the nations in Europe and trying to instruct them as to what to do. In other words, in a way, Germany is quietly taking control. Quietly quaking control with a fully-fledged European military. Combining the European powers together. And they're doing so because everybody's afraid. Maybe under Germany they could come together. The aim of the EU was that Germany might not dominate again. And so the situation's developing contrary to what people wanted in the long run. And the top autocrats admit the EU plans a massive power grab. So while NATO and the military is falling apart, but coming under because of fear, Germany and other things like that, they're endeavouring to financially come together a bit more strongly because they're worried over the financial situation, which we saw this week. So now let's move in the events in Europe. I'm going to go back now and look back over some of these things in a chronological order, in a sense, through this year. So let's go back and, first of all, show that Russia is already allying itself with and taking control of the European, the Eastern European area. This is where we're going first. Let's see if that's not so. Come back with me quite some time, a year and a bit. And Russia, who's already attacking Ukraine, has now put another 55,000 troops on its border, preparing for war. And then Greece, who's had economic problems, gone to the EU for help, is now really getting into the same situation and is now looking for more financial assistance. Now Greece is back in debt crisis, so to speak. And the Eurozone says... Well, we helped you once and you didn't do anything about it. You didn't follow our advice. So why should we help you again? But somebody's at the door, knocking. And here's thin Mrs. Grease. She's having troubles financially, isn't she? And so the result is, here he is, I'll help you. Russia. Putin, meeting up with the Prime Minister of Greece. And so they put it to the people somewhat. What do you think? They did a Gallup poll. Greece would choose Russia as an ally over NATO. Look at that. So the situation's changing there. But it's not only there. I haven't time to look at all the countries. But all those ones coloured in are flipping. 
They're beginning to align themselves more with Russia because of their fear. Look, he is hungry. Their new prime minister. Russia is not a threat, says he. Russia should not be perceived as a threat to Hungary. Hungary is seeking closer ties with Moscow. Little wonder. They're afraid. Remember, nobody would spend over 2% a little while ago. Armaments are well behind what it should be. And here's America saying, well, should we help you? And so let's come back to Kaliningrad. Tensions rise surrounding Russian enclave, uh, or exclave, of Kaliningrad amid build-up of military forces. So this was bumping up last year. Now it's growing more. And the chief of NATO said, I can take all of those countries, Estonia, Lithuania, Lithu Estonia, Latvia, Lithuania, Russia could take all of them in 36 to 60 hours. I showed you that last year. But it's still very true. Very true. And those countries are very fearful. As I pointed out before, that country down there has also printed another book telling everybody what to do, like Sweden is now talking about doing. And it's done a second copy to everybody there. And here, Poland. Russia is not a threat. It is a threat to all of Europe. And so she's terrified. She said, we've got to have Russian tr American troops here to prevent a Russian attack. So guess what? In they came. British troops from NATO, the biggest show of force against Moscow since the Cold War. Yeah, Britain came over to help them dramatically. Guess how many soldiers they sent over? 120. Biggest since the Cold War. A lot of good that'll be against the million-odd Russians. And then America responds. 1,100 soldiers, okay, deployed in Poland to deter a possible Russian attack. The leader of Estonia said, listen, that's just not enough. They sent troops into him. They said, well, look, we'll control the airports. We will control the airports. And then we can land stuff in within two days. The leader of Estonia said, our capital city will fall in four hours. It's a highway between us and Russia. And they'll have their tanks in our capital city in four hours. Too late. Too late. So here's Europe in terror, and particularly Eastern Europe, who's all beginning to look like it'll give up in a blink or capitulate. But now let's come over to Western Europe. What's going on there? Oh, Russia's intimidating them. Remember those missiles that we talked about a few minutes ago going into Kaliningrad? Well, in Russia, there's a few other ones. Here's one. This is called the Satan II missile. There it is. It is, weighs about 100 tonnes, pretty powerful. And not only that, it has 12 warheads on it. Hydrogen bombs. Now, Russia has hydrogen bombs, quite good hydrogen bombs. Here's one. The biggest bomb in world history. It has the explosive power equal to 10 times the entire combined five firepower of World War II. And there's 12 of those warheads on the top. And there's several of these missiles facing Europe. Wouldn't you be in terror? And they reckon one of those missiles, Russia says, could take out the whole of France, one of them. So the situation looking very frightening. There's the missile scene. But now here's the military scene. Russia's biggest war game in Europe, says The Economist. What happened was, in August the 10th, The Economist wrote this up, saying this huge war game is going to go on on the borders of Europe up here. Along the border between Belarus and Poland particularly. They reckon, Russia said, we're bringing only 12,700 soldiers in there. Only 12,700 soldiers. But the economists made a few inquiries and found out they had enlisted or got control, 
for the purpose of moving their military in uh, 4,000 carriage railway carriages to take the troops in. On the basis of their calculation, 100,000 went in. And it appears to be true. It appears to be true. Instead of the 12,000, economist says 100,000. And so here, September the 10th to the 22nd, was one of the largest Russian manoeuvres ever seen. World War III fears, says the British paper. Fears as Russia troops won't leave after war games on Europe's border. And that was their headlines. Won't leave. Warsaw and NATO on high alert as Zapad, and Zappa means Western, Western 2017 manoeuvres took place. And what took place? That's what happened. Into that area came the 100,000 troops plus equipment. And now they're saying they're still there in all those various places. Already there were many up in that area as we poured out before, but now throughout this area. Russia left their troops in Belarus, Reuters. Not a light reporter. Russia has left troops behind after staging war games in Belarus. They lied. They didn't tell the truth. They now got them on the borders of Europe. So here's the scene. Here's the scene. Estonia. They reckon their capital city will fall in four hours. La Lithuania. Written two books on what to do when Russia takes over. Told everybody to dig in their garden and put a little room down there. Put enough food for a year's supply. And if you take medicine, get two years and put it down there. Because when Russia comes... You won't be able to get it. Time is running out, they're saying. Be prepared. They've got road routes, how you could get out if you wanted to possibly get out through here into Poland. And it's only a 40 kilometre little stretch there. It's pretty risky. Russia could easily cut that in a moment. Or if you've got a yacht, you can sail out through here and here are the bearings. They're telling everybody what to do. But I don't know if I'd like to go out into that ocean here on my yacht because during the manoeuvre, this happened. Russia launched a massive armada for the large, uh, latest Baltic sea drills to check combat readiness. 70 naval vessels came in just before the Zapad manoeuvre. It was followed by another 40. They weren't all naval vessels. Some of them were freighters with supplies on board. 70 vessels to combat readiness drills in the waters of northern Europe came in, and many of them are still in the area of Kaliningrad, in the port. So the thing is frightening, seen that right on the starting gun, so to speak, ready to go at a moment's notice. And Russia, for some years now, has been building up to attack America over the North Pole, the shortest route. Missiles an aircraft and such like to come in across Alaska into USA if necessary. The scene is indeed quite frightening. We don't hear about that over here, but in Europe they do. And little wonder many of them are very concerned, very concerned as to where things are going. Now, I've used this cartoon before, but the point is still there. <laughs> Here's the NATO countries and the Baltic countries. What have they got? They've got a paper, pre paper protection. NATO. It's only like a piece of card. Warning, protected by NATO. And NATO is falling apart. NATO allies has put four battalions on the eastern border with Russia. Number three, 31,500. Did that a year ago. But Russia's potentially got more than that. Three million odd soldiers that could face them. So the scene is really, really quite frightening. But then to see this, as we said before, here's Mrs. Merkel, and she met up with Trump, and Trump said, You got to pay more? And Merkel versus Trump. German leader warns Europe can no longer rely on Donald Trump. Europe can no longer rely on America. And there's good reasons for that as far as America's concerned. They won't pay the money. America's got economic problems. 
we need the assistance, you need to be helping too. Nothing's happening or wasn't happening. More on that in a minute. So they're now realising America may not come over in the way they thought to defend them. So the election comes up and Merkel almost totally loses. She gains only 33%. And the election results left her isolated and it looks like she might just this month be able to get a coalition together. She has been trying for the last nearly six months talking to her, the opposition parties to get together a coalition to rule Germany. Germany is in a fragile state. A very fragile state. And here's what some of the papers are sort of saying. Caught between America and Russia. Why Russia? Well, some of those parties want to align with Russia, not with America. And if she makes a deal with them, when the trouble comes, they'll probably just drop the bundle in a moment. So, take this party, for instance, has called for Germany to change its policy towards Russia. Others demand a common European home with Russia. The scene is changing. Merkel was strong, but it's gone. She's very weak now. And in France, a new man's come in, and he's looking at it slightly differently. What's he saying? We've got to get a European defence force together. America's not going to come. Britain's not going to come. We'd better start arming ourselves. We must have a joint European defence force, strengthen the Eurozone, Deepen new EU integration. United. But the situation is, it's falling apart. Mid falling support. He's making a strong stand for it. And the result was, the EU countries agreed to create a European mega army. 23 countries integrate their defence force. But the situation, brethren and sisters, is this. Yes, they might unite. And what we might see, therefore, is Daniel's image standing and instead of being united with Britain and America, Russia. The head. Russia. So here we are. 70 years ago, the EU was set up. But now it's breaking up. And they're endeavouring to defend themselves, to integrate their defence. And Europe's policies are changing dramatically. Now, this one is slightly off the course of what we talked about, but look at this. Things are altering. The spirit of Holocaust is stirring in Germany. Anti-Semitism is sweeping Germany. Now, it's not as big as in times past, but there is indeed a very much a bit of that spirit in parts of Germany. Well, we can see the scene returning to the Second World War, but this time World War Three, And not Europe and Germany opposing Russia, but Russia occupying Europe and Europe aligning itself with Russia and the image standing up before our eyes. But brethren and sisters, for us, the critical question is when? Brethren and sisters, this is what we need to know. We don't have the answers for that. But we know that it's soon, and that's the important point of what we've looked at. Now, we read this in a sense. We looked at the Olivet Prophecy in Mark 13. Let's look at Luke. You can turn it up if you like. Luke chapter 21, verse 25 says, There shall be upon the earth distress of nations. Isn't that what we've heard tonight? Look at your Britain. Look at Europe. With perplexity, no way out. Oh yes, they're forming a mega army. Is that going to solve it? Too late. Too late. Men's hearts failing for, for fear. Ask the king of the leader of Estonia. Four hours and we're gone. And for looking after those things which are coming on the earth. They can see the scene. Surely that's what we're seeing. But then he goes on to say, when these things, now look at that word there, begin. Has it begun, brethren and sisters? 
when these things begin to come to pass, then for us, look up, lift up your heads. We've got none of the morbid feelings that Europe has in its fear. Lift up your heads, for your redemption draweth nigh. It's just around the corner. How long have we got? Well, I want to look at, particularly for a minute, America. I haven't looked at it before, but in a funny way. Well, not a funny way, but in a different way. America is now totally distracted. What's bothering it is this, on the brink of war. Can it come to Europe's aid? I want you to answer this question as we look at some of these facts. So we bring things to a close ultimately. North Korea's situation more concerning than ever after the new tirade. And remember, we looked at the doomsday clock. And the closest to doomsday was 1953. That was the Korean War. And it's back on the list. That's where the doomsday clock sits. They are really afraid. And so the situation here is North Korea vows it can hit Guam and places like that. There are four missiles that take out the island. You know, we're ready for a little bit of war. We've got our soldiers together. And so things are moving on. Then they let off an H-bomb. People didn't expect that. Remember we looked at that H-bomb where the rush has got? Theirs wasn't just as big as that. Not as big as ten times the explosive power that was dropped in the Second World War. No way at all. Theirs was only big enough that when they measured it, in South Korea on the earthquake Richter scale, it came to that. 5.3 on the Richter scale. Hey, Christchurch was hit a few years ago with a 7.1. Huge damage. Adelaide was hit in 1953-54, if I recall correctly, with a 5.4, and every second house had damage in it. Not big damage, but damage in it. I can remember you could put your hand through the brick wall as a young child. Till it got repaired. That's the size. And it was felt in the next country. There's the bomb they've got. All right? And then they launch a missile. Here it is, North Korea missile launch. It's ICBM capable, intercontinental ballistic capable. It could tra it travel at about 4,000 K vertically, but it could travel at least 10,000 K. It could go into orbit. The only problem is re-entering in. And it looks like they got it reasonably right. It didn't burn up. Vertically coming in, 14,000 kph would burn up. If they can get it down an angle of about 45 degrees, they can get it in at 7,000 kph. And it won't burn up. And then we can hit. And they could hit Darwin. That's what they claimed. It could hit maybe much of Australia. In fact, it could go into orbit and hit anywhere. Crazy. America is scared. World War Three. US Army prepares for North Korean invasion as nuclear row escalates. They're worried about it coming into South Korea. They're worried about problems taking place. And so here's Trump saying, we've got to prepare for this. We've got to get ourselves ready for it. Well, brethren and sisters, here's a time of perplexity. No way out. America's not going to come to Europe's aid. No way. Not while this threat is at the back door. I'll tell you a little other thing. Twice, very wisely, Trump has been to the UN and asked the United Nations to vote that nobody trades with North Korea. Twice he's done so. And he got everybody agreeing to buy nothing from them. Let them economically go destitute, except for two countries, Russia and China. Who's behind North Korea? Russia said, we'll buy anything you like. Why? Because it's debilitating America. America's not going to come to Europe's aid while this threat is at its back door. So, brethren and sisters, he comes suddenly, doesn't he? Remember Luke 21 or the quote that we've just looked at. Look what it says. Behold the fig tree. Israel came into existence. When? This year, 70 years ago. 70 years, Psalm 90, verse 10, the period of a generation. 
Behold the fig tree and all the trees, when they now shoot forth, verily I say unto you, this generation, and that's many of us, shall not pass away before it's all fulfilled. We're living at that time, brethren and sisters. Here we are. Is it going to be this year? I don't know. I do hope so. But one thing's for sure. Things have been speeding up, haven't they? Look at this week. Last week I couldn't tell you all about that financial situation. But Isaiah 60, the ESV version says, Your people shall all be righteous. He's talking about the saints, the Jewish people in the kingdom age. They shall possess the land forever. Here we are, taste of the kingdom, isn't it? And I am Yahweh, and in its time, I will hasten it. What does that mean? I'll speed it up. And my goodness, it looks that way now. I've never seen it like this, brethren and sisters. It's speeding up like we've never seen it before. Now, my appeal, brethren and sisters, we need to be watchful. Remember what we said before. Let it watch, let it move us, let it encourage us. Cause us to be people who want to turn to God with all our heart, soul and might. Be men of prayer, men of diligence, striving to do that which Christ wants and God wants. It's a repeated statement right through the word of God. Watch is used in the Olivet Prophecy. Matthew four times, Mark four times, Luke once. Paul also said, watch. First of Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 6, we looked at it last time. And in Revelation 16, Christ's final warning for us, watch. Let us be people then, brethren and sisters, who are diligent in God's word, but allow what we see to enthuse us and encourage us to centre our attention on the things of God. That's the key point. Not so much the watching, yes, only the watching insofar as Christ knows and God knows, it will enthuse us to be focused on the things of God and the truth and indeed preparing for thy kingdom come. And when thy will be done in earth as it is done in heaven.